Good morning, learners and viewers. This session is for research methodology for management decisions, MMPC 015. We will be continuing with secondary data. In our pre previous session, we have discussion on the sources of primary data and secondary data. Now we are on the verge of scrutiny of the secondary data. Primary data are to be scrutinized after the questionnaires are completed by the interviewers. Likewise, the secondary data are to be scrutinized before they are compiled from the source. The scrutiny should be made to access the suitability, reliability, adequacy, and accuracy of the data to be compiled and to be used for the proposed study. There are some, as said, about the scrutiny of the process. The first one is the suitability. In particular, the conformity of the de definitions, units of measurement, and the time frame should be checked. For example, one US gallon is different from one British gallon. Reliability. The reliability of the secondary data can be ascertained from the collecting agency, mode of collection, and time of collection. For instance, secondary data collected by a voluntary agency with unskilled 
investigators, very unlikely to be reliable. Adequacy. The source of data may be suitable and reliable, but the data may not be adequate for the proposed inquiry. The original data may cover a bigger or narrower geographical region, or the data may not cover suitable periods. First one is accuracy. The user must be satisfied with the accuracy of the secondary data. The process of collecting raw data, the reproduction of process data in the publication, the degree of accuracy desired and achieved should be satisfactory and acceptable to the researcher. Now, we move to Unit 5, which pertains to attitude, measurement, and skills. There are a number of management decisions which are taken in an organization from time to time. The decisions may relate to the acquisition or disposal of materials, machines, manufacturing or marketing of products, hiring or firing of employees, opening or close down of plants, promotion or revision of personnel, and so on. Some of these decisions may rely on data for which the units of measurements are capable of statistical manipulation. Such data largely refers to quantifiable parameters or numerical properties of a given population. The units of measurement of such data are not interchangeable and are not susceptible to rigorous statistical analysis. The major area of utilization of such data lies in the discipline of marketing, where the manager is interested in knowing the attitudes of the current and potential users of his or her product or services towards his or her product or service concept or idea. This knowledge of attitude should result in decisions which should be sensible and effective. Attitudes, attributes and beliefs. Each object, product, service is believed to be composed of certain characteristics which fulfill certain needs of its user. These needs may be psychological, physical or social in nature. The characteristics of the body object under consideration are called its attributes. Finally, the term attitude refers to the predisposition, mental state of individuals, users towards a product, idea, attribute of an object. The salient factors that goes into the building of an over all attitude of the individual towards the object are his or her belief about the attributes possessed by the object, his or her preference or otherwise for those attributes, and the relative importance of each attribute to the individual's decision-making process. What are the issues in attitude measurement? Measurement implies the process of obtaining information which can be subject to analysis. Attitude measurement relates to the process of measuring an individual's attitude towards an object. When we go for measurement of attitudes or any other parameter, one has to clearly sort out the following. No one, what has to be measured? <coughs> Who is to be measured? The accuracy desired in the measurement, the cost of permissible and the choice available in the measurements, data collection techniques. In attitude measurement, the researcher is primarily interested in measuring the state of mind of the respondent or respondents. It may include factors such as awareness, attitude and decision processes. There is no way to determine whether the answer given by the respondent to the level of liking for a new product such as ice cream mix represents the truth or not. The researcher, unless he is a telepathist, cannot actually observe the state of mind like preference, 
likes and dislikes etc such things can only be inferred the next important issue in attitude measurement is that who is to be measured it involves people the question to be posed now is of what kind their education age sex occupation religion etc may have a bearing on the choice of the measurement method the measurement procedure must be designed with the characteristics of the respondents under the consideration the third major issue is attitude measurement is the choices in data collection and measurement techniques the data collection techniques can be categorized into questionnaire method and observational method usually questionnaires are used for measuring the attitudes the approaches for measuring attitudes are as follows number 1 self report inventories number 2 psychological measures like galvanic skin response or pulpary response third one is projective technique like a matrix a perception test most attitude measurement methods use the self report technique however they differ in terms on the way the scales are constructed and used the weakness of self report measures is that the results are limited to what the individuals know about their attitude and are willing to relate secondly the validity of the verbalized attitude is questioned finally the last major issue for managerial research here relates to the cost and accuracy desired in the measurement as has been stated earlier these types of measurements are never entirely free of inaccuracy moreover cost and accuracy are generally reciprocal properties in measurement scaling of attitudes researchers in management have dipped into the bag of tricks of sociologists and psychologists to develop the technique for measurement of attitudes basically what is done here is to confront the respondent with anum the air of favorable and unfavorable statements about the subject and find out the extent of his or her agreement or disagreement with them there are many types of scales and scaling techniques we have to choose the most appropriate technique to suit the research being done the statements contained here it have to be prepared in such a way that the answers received can easily be converted into a numerical value the three most commonly used scales are nominal scale the ordinal scale and the interval scale nominal scale the nominal scale simply allows the categorization of responses into a number of mutually exclusive categories there are no relationship between the categories implying that there is no ranking or order the typical application of the nominal scale is in classification of responses by social class like or dislike yes or no and so ordinal scale the ordinal scale allows the respondent to rank some related alternatives by some common variables the ranking of three brands of pasteurized milk by a group of consumers on the basis of the perceived quality here it is feasible for a user of the product to rank the brands from the best to the worst interval scale the deficiencies of the normal nominal and the ordinal scales are taken here in the interval scale the scale has an arbitrary zero point with numbers placed equally appearing intervals mostly the nominal and the ordinal type of scales are used in attitude measurements most of the attitude measurement scales used are ordinal in nature though there is attempt to treat the resulting data as interval 
scale. The simplest possible type of such scales has the respondent classifying the object, issue, product, himself into one among two discontinuous categories. The attitude measurement scales can be categorized into those which are unidimensional in nature and those which are multidimensional. The different type of single dimensional attitude measurement scales which are available are graphical and numerical scales, summative scales, pair comparison, equal appearing intervals, etc. Now, we move to deterministic attitude measurement model. We start with Gutman scale. In the deterministic attitude measurement technique, the underlying assumption is that each statement has a perfect relationship of one type or another with the particular dimension of the attitude being investigated. Gutman scale analysis is usually applied to Dacomanus data, that is data with only two variables, yes or no, or zero or one, agree or disagree, etc. However, a number of reasons have been made the Gutman scale and impractical tool for the measurement of attitudes. Second one is first one equal appearing interval scale. Under such an appropriate approach, the selection of items is made by a panel of judges who evaluate the items in terms of whether they are relevant to the topic area and ambiguous in implication. The judges are expected to make the intervals between the groups equal. The mean rating by judges is taken at the scale for each item. Items which are found to be ambiguous or irrelevant are dropped. The items selected for the final scale are such that each item has a small standard deviation of ratings over the judges and the mean ratings spread evenly from one end of the rating quantum to the other. The selected items are listed in random order to form the final scale. After developing the scale as stated, the respondents are asked during the administration of the scale to check the statements with which they agree. The median value of the statements that they check is worked out and this establishes their score or quantifies their opinion. It may be noted that in the actual instrument, the statements are arranged in random order of scale value. The Thurston method has been widely used for developing differential scales, which are utilized to measure attitudes toward varied issues like war, religion, etc. The method is not completely objective. It involves ultimately subjective decision process. The next one is the semantic differential scale. Semantic differential scale or the ST scale was developed by Charles E. Osgood, J.G. G.J. Suchi and P.H. Fedman. They back in 1957 is an attempt to measure the psychological meanings of an object to an individual. This scale is based on the presumption that an object can have different dimensions of quantitative meaning which can be located in multi-dimensional property space or what can be called the semantic space in the context of ST scale. This scaling consists of set of bipolar rating scales, usually of seven points, by which one or more respondents rate one or more concepts in each scale item. For instance, the SD scale items for analyzing candidates for leadership position will be shown. Here we can see that at the bottom line we have 0, on the right we have minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, on the left we are moving 1, 2, 3, and up. It is starts from social level, true, fast, 
active, strong, progressive, hot, heavy, severe, successful. And on the right side, we have just the opposite one. Unsuccessful, lenient, light, cold, aggressive, weak, passive, slow, false and unsocial. Candidates for leadership position, along with the concept, the ideal candidate may be compared and may have scored them from plus three to minus three on the basis of above script scale. The letter EPA showing the relevant factors, which evaluation, potency, and activity respectively. Written on the left side are not written on the actual scale. Summative models. The Likert scale. In a summative model, one obtains the total score by adding scores on individual items. For the statements that imply negative attitudes, the scoring is reversed. The scale allows an expression for the intensity of feeling. These scales are called Likert scales. Here, instead of having just agree and disagree in the scale, we have intensities varying from strongly agree or strongly disagree. For example, when asked to express opinion, whether one considers his job quite pleasant, the respondent may respond in any one of the following ways. Strongly agree, agree, undecided, disagree, or strongly disagree. Here, five points constitute the scale. At one extreme of the scale, there is a strong agreement with the given statement, and at the other, we have strong disagreement, and, and in between the line, the intermediate points. Q-sort technique. The Q-sort technique grew out of a more general methodology for the study of verbalized attitudes references, etc. The peculiar characteristic of this methodology is that here it is more important to make comparisons among different responses within respondents than between respondents. Thus, it is a comparative method. In the area of management, the application of q sort has come up in marketing research. For instance, for a cosmetic product like shampoo, he may be asked to compare alternatives with adjectives like easy to use, economical, and safe for children, with instructions to array them along the quantum least preferred the ideal shampoo. Essentially, what the respondent have done here is to array the attribute along the scale. The q sort technique is faster and less tedious for subjects than paired comparison measure. It also forces the subject to confer to quotas at each point of the scale so as to yield a normal or quasi-normal distribution. Multi-dimensional scale. The earlier studied measurement processes tells little about the relative importance of different characteristics or how the characteristics relate to each other. When these aspects become important, one takes recourse of multidimensional scale. It is a term used to describe a group of analytical techniques used to study attributes, especially those relating to perceptions and preferences. These techniques attempt to identify the object attributes that are important to the respondents and to measure their relative importance. The major application of multidimensional scaling is again in marketing research. Now, selection of an appropriate attitude measurement scale. We have examined a number of different techniques which are available for the measurement of attitude. Each has some strength and some weaknesses. But at the same time, 
all techniques are not suitable for all purposes. Then, selection of the scale depends on the stage and size of the research project. The cost of developing and implementing the instrument, reliability and validity of the instrument and the statistical analysis necessary. Generally, third stone scale, Q sort and such semantic differential scales are preferred for preliminary investigation. The Likert scale is used for item analysis. For specific attributes, the semantic differential scale is very appropriate. Now, we move to unit six, which is related to questionnaire design. A set of questions with some option or no option that will be asked to study respondents is known as questionnaire. The questionnaire may be used in various research fields like surveys, face-to-face -face interviews, telephonic interviews, and online or offline surveys. The function of questionnaire is it helps the researcher in data collection makes a structure for the interview process. It gives the respondent options for op answering the questions in a structured way. After the collection of the data, it helps in processing the data also. What are the contents of the questionnaire? According to the researcher, each part of the questionnaire should contribute to the survey. The question should be strong enough to produce the necessary data from the interview. Participants must comprehend the questions in the manner desired by the researcher. This removes the chance of incorrect response. Two factors influence a respondent's inability to respond to questions. Genuine uncertainty about the topic, inability to recollect the answer, and failure to verbalize the data. If the information derived from such a questionnaire is critical, the questionnaire can be phrased in conspiracy to prevent drawing the respondent's attention. What are the different formats of the questionnaire? Questionnaire format depends on the nature of the research carried out. The format of questions that can be included with the questionnaire are open-ended questions, closed-ended questions, and third one is type of the questions. We will start with open-ended questions. An open-ended question involves participants responding in their own words instead of being limited to predefined posts. Options. They are likely to known as responses with finite questions or unsaturated type of questions. Open-ended questions can serve as the memory exercise as they require the respondent for recalling past experiences. It leads to the development of record, the gathering of information, and the enhancement of understanding. Following are the advantages of open-ended questions. Open-ended questions should uncover unusual, but the intelligent opinions about uh, that the participants would have overlooked or else. Second one is the respondent enjoys more freedom of expression. Third, there is no bias as a result of limited response ranges. And respondents are free to qualify their responses. Similarly, as there are some advantages, there are disadvantages also. With open-ended questions, respondents don't have the option to select or click their choice from an online or in applies application survey. Lower response rates, difficult to compare, a lot of noise of irre or irrelevant information is shared, hard to analyze and free response questions are there. Second part is closed-ended questions. These closed-ended questions are those questions which provide 
option to the respondent who are answering the questions. This type of questions provide less options to the respondent. The options are set by the researcher and the research wants the respondent answer in a mentioned options only. If the researcher wants to know the respondent's intention towards any product, then Likert scale will be used for strongly agree or decide. The advantages of close-ended questions are easier and quicker to answer, helps in obtaining measurable and quantitative data, better understanding through answer options, customers are more likely to respond, and it helps to get rid of irrelevant answers. If we talk about the disadvantages, unable to provide detailed information, cannot help to receive customer opinions. It is not possible to cover all possible answers, and more choices can create more confusion. What are the steps in identifying in designing the question? First one is identify your research aim and the goal of your question. Second step is define your target respondents. Third one is develop questions. Fourth one is choose your questions type. Fifth, design question sequence and overall layout. And sixth one, run a pilot study. Structure and design of questionnaire. If the problem is related to marketing problem, a tire manufacturing company is planning to launch a new tire for scooters or motorcycles. The company would like to have information about how consumers select a brand of tire for such vehicles. If we talk about marketing research objectives, what they will be thinking of to estimate the prevailing level of brand awareness among consumers and to what degree the consumers are able to differentiate between company name and brand name. Second one is to identify the attributes of scooter or motorcycle tires which are important to consumers and to what extent these attributes influence buying behavior. Third one is to study the buying process for scooter or motorcycle tires. What is the information? required. Top of the mind and awareness of manufacturers of scooter and motorcycle tires. Second one is consumers perception of brand and the importance they attach to brand names. The extent to which the consumers think the following attributes, company name, great design, road grip, long life, and comfort ability are present in the tires they are using. Fourth one is the degree of importance that the consumers attach to the attributes mentioned above. Fifth one is the buying process involved in the selection of a tire. And the sixth one is consumers' attitude towards free field. Management of fieldwork. Data collection in a marketing research study may require utilizing the services of many interviews. In marketing research studies involves extensive tools, the interviewer must have good health. Secondly, he should have a pleasing personality. Number third one, knowing the given nature of the Indian market, they must have command over local and some regional languages. The fourth one, an interviewer should be able to communicate freely with the respondents. Before the interviews are, interviewers are sent out for data collection, the interviewers must be thoroughly briefed about the project and the manner in which data are to be collected. Now, we move to Unit 7, which is related to sampling and sampling design. This is a very base, important topic because while we are going through it, we have different type of questions in our mind. Why this much has been selected? 
how this has been selected and why this has been selected. So here in this unit, we will be discussing about, we will be learning about what is sampling, what is sample design and uh, what are the different types of sampling methods. The terminology sampling indicates the selection of a part of a group or an aggregate with a view to obtaining information about the whole. This aggregate or the totality of all members is known as population, although they need not to be a human. These listed parts, which is used as to ascertain the characteristics of the population are called sample. While choosing a sample, the population is assumed to be composed of individual units or members, some of which are included in the sample. The total number of members of the population and the numbers included in the sample are called population size and sample size respectively. What are the advantages of sampling over Celsius? The Celsius or complete generation consists in collecting data from each and every unit from the population. The sampling only chooses a part of the units from the population for the sample study. The sampling has a number of advantages as compared to complete enumeration due to variety of reasons. It is less expensive, less time consuming, greater accuracy is there, and it is destructive information. Simple random sampling. The representative character of a sample is ensured by allocating some probability to each unit of the population for being included in the sample. The sample, simple random sample assigns equal probability to each unit of population. The simple random sample can be chosen both with and without replacement. Suppose we have the population consist of capital N units and we want to select a sample size of small n units. If we talk about simple random sampling with replacement, then what, how this sample will be selected? In a manner that every unit of the population has an equal chance of 1 by n to be included in the sample. In each case, each unit of population has an equal chance of 1 by n to be included in each of the n units of the sample. Similarly, if it is simple random sampling without replacement. When the first unit is chosen, every unit of the population has a chance of 1 by 10 to be included in the sample. Now, the second unit is selected, then the remaining n minus 1 members of the population, so that each unit has a chance of selecting now as 1 by n minus 1 to be included in the sample. Sampling frame. A sampling frame is a list of all the units of the population. The preparation of the sampling frame is sometimes a major practical problem. The frame should always be made up to date and be free from errors of emission and duplication of sampling units. A perfect frame identifies each element once and only once. Perfect frames are seldom available in real life. Incomplete frame, when some legitimate sampling units of the population are omitted, the frame is said to be incomplete. If we want to collect information regarding the political opinion of a group or voters on a sample basis, a complete list of voters is necessary to select a sample. Inaccurate frame. When some of the sampling units of the population are listed inaccurately, or some units which do not actually exist are included, the frame is said to be inaccurate. Inadequate frame. 
a frame that does not include all units of population by its structure is an inadequate frame. If we use the list of names included in the telephone directory of a city as the frame for selecting a sample to collect information about a consumer product, obviously it will be an inadequate frame. Probabilistic aspect of sampling. Simple random sampling is based on the concept of probability. The use of probability in sampling theory makes it reliable to, to draw inferences or conclusions about the population. The management would like to know the percentage or proportion of units in the population with a certain characteristic. An organization selling consumer products may like to know the proportion of potential customers using a certain type of cosmetic. A government may like to know the percentage of small farmers owning some cultivable land in a rural region. Similarly, a manufacturer planning to export some product may be interested to ascertain the proportion of defect-free units. His system is capable of manufacturing. Stratified random sampling. The basic idea behind the stratified sampling is to divide the whole heterogeneous population into smaller groups or subpopulation, such that sampling units are homogeneous with respect to the characteristics under the study with the subpopulation and heterogeneous with respect to the characteristics under study between or among the subpopulation. Such subpopulations are termed as strata. Treat each subpopulation as a separate population and draw a sample by SRS from each strata. The strata basically stratified rental sampling is a method of sampling that involves dividing the population into smaller groups called strata. The groups or strata are organized based on the shared characteristics or attributes of the members in the group. The process of classifying the population into groups is called stratification. Now, we take up an example over here. We have three startups, one, two, three, and we have number of elements in the stratum 200, and your sample size is N1, 10, 15, and 25 respectively for three stratum. Now, what is the sampling ratio? Sampling ratio is one by, uh, that is 10 by 200, 15 by 300, and 25 by 500. Here's what we got. Numerically, if we talk about in general, it will be 50 by 1000, which will come out to be 1 by 20. And similarly, if we are going to add up all the last column, that again comes out to be 1 by 20. So here, mathematically, we can see how this is converted. Small n1 is equal to small n by capital N into and similarly, it is for all strata. This appropriational stratified sampling. Another question is that we have sigma 1 square and sigma 1. That is, we are talking about stratum variance and stratum standardization. When this is collected, so it's very simple 2.25 under root is 1.5, 4 under root is 2 and 0.25 under root is 0.5. Now, your sampling ratio will be 0 0.065, 0 0.087, and 0 0.22. Again, a mathematical relation is there, and one upon capital N1 into sigma 1. Cluster sampling. A colony is divided into 11 blocks, each called block A through block B. Cluster sampling is used in this situation by treating each block as a cluster. 
two blocks are selected out of the 11 blocks at random and their information is collected from all families residing in these two blocks. Now, what is the basic difference between cluster sampling strata? Strata are homogeneous within and different from other strata. Clusters should be heterogeneous within and the different clusters should be similar to each other. A cluster is a mini population and has all the features of the population. The criteria used for certification is a variable associated with the characteristics made. Convenience of data collection is usually the basis for cluster definition. And lastly, there are very few strata, but many clusters. Multi-stage and multi-phase sampling. Multi-stage sampling where the sampling units is sometimes larger than an individual element of the population in all stages, but the final. And multi-phase sampling, it is designed to make use of the information collected in one phase to develop a sampling design in a subsequent phase. A study with two phases is often called double sampling. In general, there are three types of non-probability sampling that may, under appropriate conditions, be useful in business and government. They are convenience sampling, judgment sampling, and quota sampling. Convenience sampling in this type of non-probability sampling, the choice of the sample is left completely to the convenience of the interview. The cost involved in picking up the sample is minimum and the cost of data collection is also generally low. For example, a ball pen manufacturing company is interested in knowing the opinions about the ball plan, like smooth flow of ink, resistance to breakage of the cover, etc. It is presently manufacturing with a view to modify it to suit customers' needs. Purposive sampling. In convenient sampling, any member of the population can be included in the sample without any restriction. When some restrictions are put on the possible inclusion of the members in the sampling, the sampling is called purposive. For example, a researcher might visit a few shops to observe what brand of vegetable oil people are buying so as to make influence about the share of the popular particular brand he is interested in. Judgment sampling. In judgment sampling, the judgment or opinion of some experts form the basis of sample selection. The experts are persons who are believed to have information on the population which can help in giving us better samples. Such sampling is very useful when we want to study rare events or when members have extreme positions or even the, when the objectives of the study is to collect a wide cross-section of views from one extreme to the another. For example, the method could be used in a study involving the performance of salesmen. The salesman could be grouped into a top grade and low grade performer according to the certain specified qualities. Having done so, the sales manager may indicate who is this opinion would fall into this category. Needless to mention, this is a biased method. However, in the absence of any objective data, one might have to resort to this type of sample. Quota sampling. We might want our sample to be representative of the population in some defined ways. This is sought to be achieved in quota sampling so that the bias introduced by sampling could be reduced. For example, income group, family size, or overall relative frequency. Now, sample size. The larger the variability, 
the Lalda River Central Science required. The confidence in the inference made, the larger the sample size, the larger is the confidence. Yes. The cost of the study is the problem. Now, we move to block three, which is related to data presentation and analysis. We will be starting with unit eight, that is data processing. The data collected from the field has to be processed and analyzed as laid down in the research plan. The processing of the data primarily means editing, coding, classification, and the tabulation of the data collected so that they are amenable to analysis. Now, what is meant by editing of data? Editing of data is a process of examining the raw data to detect errors and omissions and to correct them, if possible, so as to ensure completeness, consistency, accuracy, and homogeneity. This all will facilitate coding and tabulation of the data. The editing can be done in two stages, that is field editing and central editing. If we talk about free editing, this forms of editing is necessary in view of the writing of the individuals, which vary from individual to individual and sometimes difficult for the tabulator to understand. This sort of editing should be done as soon as possible after the injury, as it may be necessary sometimes to recall the map. Central editing. Central editing should be carried out when all the forms of the schedule have been completed and returned to the headquarters. This type of editing requires that all the forms are thoroughly edited by a single person who is the editor in a small field study or a group, small group of persons in case of a large study. The editor may correct the obvious errors such as the entry in a wrong place etc now classification of data in most studies voluminous raw data collected through a survey needs to be reduced into a homogeneous group for any meaningful analysis these necessities classification of data which is simple Terms is the process of arranging data in group or classes on the basis of some characteristics. Classification helps in making comparisons and drawing meaningful conclusions. Classifications can either be according to attribute or according to numerical characteristics. In case of classification, according to the attributes, the data is classified by descriptive, for example, sex, caste, education, land holding, etc. are included. The descriptive characteristics refers to the quantitative approach, which cannot be measured quantitatively. Only their presence or absence in an individual can be observed. Several aspects of classification of data have been detailed in presentation. Where is block two? Now, tables as data presentation devices. The statistical data may be presented in forms of tables and graphs. In the tabular form, the classification of data is made with reference to time or some other variables. The graphs are used as a visual form of presentation of data. The tabulation is used for summarization and condensation of the data. Following are the important characteristics of a table. Every table should have a clear and concise title to make it understandable without reference to the text. This title should always be just about the body of the table. Every table should be given a distinct number to facilitate easy reference. Third one is every table should have compositions, column headings, 
and stubs, that is row heading, and they should be clear and brief. Fourth one is the units of measurement added must always be indicated. Graphical representation of data. There are several types of graph or charts that are used to present statistical data. Of them, the following are commonly used. Bar chart, two-dimensional diagrams, pictograms, pie chart, and arithmetic chart or line chart. Two-dimensional diagrams. The commonly used two-dimensional diagrams are rectangular diagrams and squares. In rectangular diagrams, the rectangles are used to represent the data in the graphical form. The diagrams are used for comparing two sets of data. The height of the rectangle is proportional to the ratio of the data which bears to each other in a given series and the width of the rectangle varies in proportion to the angle. Pictograms. In this form of presentation, data are presented by Namaste. How can I For example, a population figures are presented by the picture of a human being. Production figures or say auto, auto bikes is represented by the picture of the motorcycle motorbike. State population is represented by a picture of a character and so on. Pie chart. It is a difference where the different segments of a circle represent percentage contribution of various components to the total. It brings out the relative importance of various components of the data. If we construct a circle of any diameter, then the circle is broken into a desired number of segments. Therefore, everything the angle 360 will divide, will, will, uh, will uh, show 100 percent. That means this complete circle is of 360 degrees and the values per, uh, related to it, it is 100 percent. The cost of production in an industry is represented below in the form of pie chart. Line or arithmetic chart. The line or arithmetic chart is used to identify the changes in the trend that exist in a series of data. Although we can see changes in the data, the presentation of the same on a line chart gives the better picture of the information. Now, unit nine. The statistical analysis and interpretation of data. We will start with non-parametric test. In general, class of testing the hypothesis, these tests, particularly known as parametric test, assumes that the parameters such as mean, cell division, etc., exist and are used to develop our test. For example, a t-test is based on the comparison of two means of two samples. The parametric test was developed with an assumption that the form of population distribution was known. And that is a test concerning a particular of the distribution was to be made. The test of hypothesis which deal there are situations, particularly in psychological or in market research studies, where in the basic assumptions underlying the parametric test are not valid, or one does not have the knowledge of the distribution of the population parameter being tested. The tests which handle problems of these types are known as non-parametric tests or distribution free test. The non-parametric tests have gained importance basically for three reasons. The first one is these tests require no or less restricting assumptions than the corresponding parametric tests. These tests are made suitable for analyzing ranked, scaled, or 
related data. And these tests involve very few arithmetic computations. It must be noted or it must be understood that when the basic assumptions about the parametric tests are valid, the non-parametric tests are less provide powerful than the parametric test. There is a greater risk of accepting a false hypothesis and thus committing a type 2 error. In non-parametric methods, the null hypothesis is somewhat loosely defined, thereby the null hypothesis is rejected. The non-parametric test yields less price conclusions comparable to the parametric ones. Following are some of the typical situations for using non-parametric tests. In mail questionnaires method of survey, more than partly fresh questions are received. Non-parametric tests are designed to take the mission data and make necessary adjustment with exact maximum information from the available data. Non-parametric tests may be used to provide reasonably good result even for very small samples. Third one, in consumer behavior, surveys of new package design, the responses are not likely to be normally distributed, but clustering around two extreme positions with a value, few respondents giving a neutral response to the package design. One sample test. One sample tests are used to answer the following questions such as, is there a significant difference between the observed and the expected frequency? It is reasonable to believe that the sample has been drawn from a specified population. And the third one, is it reasonable to accept that the sample is a random sample from some known population? But these three things has to be kept in mind. The tests which are used to obtain answers to the above questions are classified as tests for goodness of fit. Kolmogorov Simonov one sample test. This test is used for comparing the distribution of an ordinal scale. The test is concerned with the degree of agreement between the distribution of observed values and some specified theoretical distribution. It determines whether the score is in a sample can reasonably be thought to have come from a population having the theoretical distribution. With this, we will be concluding today's session and uh, in our next session, we will be continuing from this 